All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want the church to know that Wednesday night we are not going to have service again this Wednesday, just a precaution, but we will resume in-person service next Sunday. Uh, I believe that's the 28th, 29th, somewhere around there. So we'll be back in here next Sunday. This is uh, just kind of a precaution, and I ask the church to please remember your brothers and sisters in prayer of, of New Life Ministry. We've uh, got some family that's still battling COVID pretty heavily. Uh, it's uh, affected quite a few families, and uh, I won't mention any names just, just in case. I don't know if uh, there's some people that would rather not, but... Uh, and as we get started, I do want to say that it's kind of a blessing. The Lord always works in, in mysterious ways that we'll never understand. And, uh, you know, I was really just kind of going back and forth on, you know, how to, how to get things going, how to start things. And it's different doing a live feed as opposed to being here in person, right? So, uh, and then uh, Mr. Aaron Young comes knocking on the door here and uh, the Lord has sent him this morning to give his testimony, and I appreciate Aaron so much. And last week, we had talked about Matthew and uh, his call and what Jesus done for him. And uh, we had talked about how important a testimony is, a unique mark that the Lord puts on your life. And to tell it, how important it is to tell your testimony. It's, it's, a, it's a unique thing that the Lord does in you. It's a fingerprint that you have. And so... We're going to start this way this morning, and I'm going to invite Mr. Aaron Young, who has been here at New Life for a few months now, about six months, to come and give his testimony. And uh, you guys give him a warm welcome as you can online. Uh, Aaron, you want to come on? Glad you're here, brother. I would like to say that not only the Lord sent me this morning, but so did the pastor. So I didn't just show up at random. Uh, I want to thank the Lord first of all today that I'm saved and I would like to share just a few things that have went on in my life. Um, we have been going over miracles for the last few weeks in this church and I would like to firmly say as a believer in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I believe in miracles. I believe that there are times in an individual's life when God will move throughout the course of history and the course of that man's circumstances and deliberately intervene in a way that no other man ever could, that no doctor could, that no other solution could ever be found, and that God will honestly move during the impossible. If you ever read in all, in all the miracles of the Bible, God only ever deliberately reached out and did something when the something he was doing would have been considered impossible. And the reason for that is so that way he alone could get the glory. We too often run to doctors, we run to wise men, we run to other individuals for the solutions to our problem, and then they get to the point where any other solution is impossible, and then we have finally reached the place where God himself can intervene and will intervene on our behalf because he knows that, and we know, not only does he know that no other solution is out there. I want to start out... Uh, a few years ago, whenever I was a boy growing up, I would like to say that we grew up very poor. We had a hole in the floor where my father had fell through it, and we were un could not afford to fix it. We were just a little family. We, I had one brother and one sister. My parents were still married at the time. And looking back on those days, we didn't have a whole lot. If it hadn't been for my grandfather, I can't imagine what would have happened. And one day, a preacher from Temple Hill just came and knocked on the door. And he said, uh, hello, Timmy, that was my father's name. I've come to talk to you about the Lord. And through a chain of events and a series of processes, my father ended up getting saved, and he got us into church. And I want to say that God looked after us so much during those years, those times when he had nothing and saw us to a much better place. He got us out of that mess, got us into a better home, got us into a place where we had food in the shelves, food in the fridge. And he took us out of where we were. He left that memory there. But he showed us just exactly how, where his delivering power would start. And as time moved on and time progressed, there were many things that went on throughout my life that I'll not discuss, but I can tell you that God's divine hand of protection and sustenance has always been over me during that time. And whenever I was a teenager, I started to develop some trouble in my back. I started to have a little bit of issue walking. I, have one left leg now that even to this day I don't really have a lot of feeling in and that numbness has been progressively moving throughout the years 
So when I was about 17, I started going and seeing a few doctors, and then I sat down with a doctor from Bowling Green, a neurologist. And when I was 18 or 19 years old, that doctor sat down and he looked at me and he said, by the time you are 25, you'll be in a wheelchair. You'll be unable to walk. You'll have to have someone push you wherever you go. He said, my best bet for you is to go ahead and get your disability paperwork started. You'll be unable to work. He told me that I was going to have to quit college. He wanted to put me in physical therapy three days a week. And my response to that was not very necessarily positive, but after some time of going back and forth and seeing other doctors getting put on all the medication an individual can possibly stand uh, to the point that I had almost ruined my life, I decided that I was going to put things into God's hands like I should have originally. And throughout the course of years, different things came and went. I stand before you today completely unmedicated, however. My problems are completely managed. All through the divine grace and providence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I remember at the peak of my problem, I had just came home from work. I had been sent home by my manager because I was unable to even lift a five-pound box off of a cart and put it onto the shelf. And my back was killing me. I couldn't feel my legs. I felt horrible. And I just looked up to heaven and I said, God, I do need some help right now. I need a solution and I need it right now. And the simplest thing just came across the television. It was an old treatment they used for polio that's completely non-invasive. I never would have learned about it any other way. No doctor ever told me. I never read about it in a medical journal or a textbook. It was just one of those instances of ask and you shall receive. And I did that for the course of about two years and I stand before you today completely unmedicated. Now, when my 25th birthday was rolling around, all that kept happening was that day with that doctor just kept nagging at me, telling me that I shouldn't be able to walk by the time I reach 25. I wondered to myself, am I going to make an immediate lapse in my progress? Is everything just going to undo itself overnight? Am I just gonna wake up one morning and not be able to walk again? And then my 25th birthday rolled around and glory to God, it was on a Sunday. And I walked into the house of God and I sat down and I took my seat. I cried all the way to church I cried through half the service, and I got to stand up and tell the church full of people that I appreciate and care about what God had done for me, about the miracle that he had performed in my life. And I would like to say to anyone this morning who may be struggling, you may be the single parent trying to raise a child living paycheck to paycheck. You may be the one with the health issue this morning. You may be the one struggling against coronavirus. You may be sitting in the ICU or you may be holding the hand of someone who is. God's hand is not short concerning our problems. And we have a high priest who is not untouched by our infirmities. That means that Jesus Christ understands. He understands your problems and he cares about your problems. Too many times in the Christian's life, we believe that God can do miracles. We believe that he will do miracles, but we don't believe that he'll do them for us. And I will like to gladly say that as sorry of a Christian as I have been, as far away from Jesus Christ as I have gotten in the past, and God has still done the things for me that he has, I can gladly say that if you're a believer in him, he'll do them for you too. Because I came to the realization one day that the times that God has helped me in my life and the divine intervention he has chose to show me, all of the miracles and all of the goodness and all the blessings he has given me, they were never based on my merits or my goodness. They were based on his goodness. And he is a good God and he is a good father and he is our king. I do not care what your president says or your governor says. The reason he says fear not is because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and everything is in his hands. You don't need to fear coronavirus. You don't need to fear the economy. He said over 365 times in one way or another that we are to fear not. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what you're going through today, he has the power to see you through it. And if you will let him, and if you'll give him the glory, he will do a miracle in your life. <laughs> Our Lord, our God, and our King, we want to thank you for this morning to come together as a people, Father. We may not be in the same building, Lord, but we are of the same spirit. We are of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us that we might find redemption in your eyes. 
who has set us up in the Holy Family, Lord. And we come to you this morning, Father, not as beggars crying and pleading, hoping that a far and distant ruler might hear us, Lord. But we come to you this morning boldly by the royal right established to us by our Lord and Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. We are asking you this morning, Father, as your children, that you would help us during this service, Lord. You'd help us during this time when we're apart and when we're separate, Lord. That you would see fit to reach down into the hands of the lives this morning of those who are stricken with infirmities, Lord. Of those who are dealing with sickness, maybe those who are grieving, Lord. Maybe those who are just under mountains of stress, Father. And Lord, we have been preached to and taught about miracles now for weeks. And I want to say what a wonderful joy right it has been to hear about these wonderful things that you've done, Lord. But Father, I believe that you are willing and ready and able this morning to do some wonderful things for the people here at New Life Ministries, Lord. I believe that there are some people in this church who are watching this broadcast this morning, Lord, who need some help straight from the throne on high. And I know that you're able to give it, Father. We've read of the miracles you've performed in days of old in the Bible, but Lord, we want to hear about some miracles you're performing for us here today. Lord, we want to see your hands reach out and touch people here, Lord. We want to see your power reached out upon the church once again. We want your help this morning, Lord. We want your intervention. And Lord, more than anything, we want to give you the glory. And Lord, we want to thank you this morning for everything you've done for us as a nation and as a people and for keeping your hand over us during these times, Lord. It's for that cause we call you king. For watching over our households and our families and our little areas and our communities, Lord. It's for that sake we call you Lord and Master, Lord, but for what you've done for us as individuals this morning. For saving our souls, for making us whole, for giving us a place where a bad man can be made good, where a foolish man can be made wise, and where a sick man can be made whole, Lord. And for all the times you've done that for us as individuals, Lord, this morning we call you friend. Thank you so much for all you've given us. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things, Lord. We're looking for a touch from on high. Amen. Isn't God good this morning? And I appreciate my brother's testimony. God is so faithful to never leave us or forsake us, and his timing is always the right timing. And as we continue through our, our study in the book of Matthew, chapter 8 and 9, we're going to keep going there, and uh, the next happening that we come to uh, this morning, we're actually going to read in the book of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn to the book of Mark in chapter 5. We'll be starting in verse 25. And before we take right off in it, I kind of want to uh, give us a refresher from last week uh, when Jesus called Matthew to be a disciple. He walked by his desk and called him. Uh, and Matthew got up, followed Jesus, and we see the miracle of salvation and the ability Jesus Christ has to change a life, to take a publican that was nothing to society, nothing to nobody, and make him a disciple. But the Pharisees last week, as they always seem to do, showed up in a really ugly way. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't wrap their heads around why Jesus would call a publican to follow him and make him a disciple. And then on top of that, Jesus went and feasted and hung out with publicans and sinners, and it just didn't make sense to them. And the Pharisees always seemed to be linked to the, the hatred and disgust of Jesus Christ, and a lot of them were truly that way. But this morning we're led to a man named Jairus, who was part of this religious sect. He was a temple official. Uh, he was friends with all the Pharisees. He was part of this religious group, but he approaches Jesus differently. They come to Jesus arrogantly in their, all their religiousness, and Jairus approaches Jesus humble and desperate. He's got a daughter that's 12 years old, and she's deathly sick. And he meets Jesus as Jesus gets off the boat, crosses the Sea of Galilee, gets back to Capernaum, and he's in this state of desperation. Jesus, you've got to come see my daughter. You've got to come heal my daughter of this sickness. And so Jesus, being Jesus, takes off that way. But on his way to Jairus' house, he runs into another woman. A woman that has no name mentioned in Scripture that at least three of the four Gospels mention. And we know her as the woman with the blood disease. And though she has no name mentioned in Scripture, she has one of the most powerful testimonies in all of Scripture. 
And that's where we pick up this morning. And there's three things I really want to highlight this morning when I go through this text that stands out to me. And one is this lady's disease. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on her disease, but I do think it's important for where we're at as a country, where we're at as a, in, in the world today. I think it's important to highlight uh, the, the relative nature of what she's going through and how it relates to us through her disease. But then also we see her desperation and finally her deliverance. And so let's look at her disease in verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Menorgia is what most theologians believe is the disease that she had. It's a hemorrhage of blood that won't stop, a continuous menstrual cycle, that, uh, a disease that some women would battle. And Moses wrote about it in the book of Leviticus. You can see for yourself in Leviticus chapter 15. And by Jewish law, any woman that suffered from this disease was labeled as unclean. Anytime she went anywhere, she had to announce her presence that I'm unclean, I'm unclean. That way, if anyone was to come in contact with her, they knew to keep their distance. Because anything this woman touched, anything she breathed on, any place she went was deemed unclean. If you were in the marketplace and you accidentally rubbed her shoulder, you had to go and wash your clothes, wash your body in quarantine for a full day. Any place this girl went, any, any, any uh, thing that happened to her, uh, she was totally isolated from the rest of the world. This is a woman that truly knows what hurt feels like and having to deal with just the pains of this disease, the hormonal issues and the pain of constantly losing blood. This is a lady that knows what uh, depression feels like, not having anyone, being totally alone. We don't know if she had a family or if she was married. But if she was, this disease by Jewish law was grounds for divorce. This is a woman that truly knows what loneliness feels like, being totally isolated from the rest of the world. This was not a fun way to live. This was this lady's life for at least 12 years. She knows what it truly means to be alone in life and what hurt feels like, not just physically, but emotionally. And I say all that this morning, not because she's some lady that we can't relate to. You know, it's a, it's a unique thing and we feel sorry for her or whatever, but that's not true. We can totally relate to the, this woman and what she's going through. We see in verse 26 here, the emotional toil that she's going through. She has suffered many physicians. She's tried remedies. She's tried medicines. She's tried vaccines. She's tried new doctors, new medicines, potions, anything she can get her hands on. She's tried it and nothing has helped. In fact, the scriptures indicate that it's gotten worse over the years. And so here she is not just in a worse state physically because of her disease, but she's in a worse state and broke out of money. The doctors have taken everything. She's got nothing left. And when the money runs out, the help runs out. Big Pharma's been around for a long time, right? So this woman's life is nothing uh, to be proud of in her eyes. She is a woman that is lonely, hurt, depressed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But when we look at her and we look at her disease and the things that she's gone through, we can't help but notice, I can't help but notice when I read through Scripture and when I reflect on life now, disease is evil Disease and viruses has been a part of our life ever since the beginning. It is, a, it is a total judgment of sin that happened in the garden. Imagine a place like Eden that was perfect. It was heaven on earth. There was no suffering. There was no pain. There was no sickness. There was no disease. But because of Adam and Eve's sin of disobedience, disobeying God, they brought sickness, disease, suffering, sweat, pain into this world. And it's something that we battle even now. We have nobody here in church because of a virus, because of disease. Diseases have wiped out civilizations from the beginning of time. America was almost never a country because of smallpox that broke out during the American Revolution. Europe was almost desolated by the Black Plague and the Bubonic Plagues. Native Americans and Central Americans were thought to have been almost six times the number of what was here when Columbus landed. But Spaniards brought disease over that wiped out the population and it reduced it to only tribes that were spread far apart. 
Disease is nothing new. Virus is nothing new. It's something that we battle all the time. We're not the first to battle it. We're not the first generation. And we won't be the last generation to battle it. Almost all of us have loved ones or friends that have had bouts with cancer. And some have been able to fight through it. And some have went on to be with their heavenly father. Disease is truly evil. And it's something that affects every aspect of our life. Look at COVID and the way it has affected our day-to-day life. Look at the way it's affected our church services. Look at the way it's affected our children, our family get-togethers. The way it's affected everything, even just going out. COVID and the virus has affected all kinds of stuff. Just the fear of disease changes our life and the way we handle our life. Disease is evil. But it's a part of our daily life. And just as my brother spoke this morning, fear is not of God. Fear is not an attribute that God has given us. He has given us not a spirit of fear, but of sound mind. But as Christians, we have to face this and say, this is part of our life. We can wish it away. We can try to live our life on fairy tales and on on rainbows and, oh, I wish this would. But this is part of our daily life. The early church had to go through martyrdom. They were constantly being pursued to to be killed and thrown in prison. It was part of their daily life. Fear is something that we have to deal with, and we have to deal with it head on. And we run to all these different things. We run to all these different medicines and potions and vaccines and remedies that don't seem to help and we're left just like this woman is now. She's depleted of everything, broken and empty. She has nothing left. And disease can also symbolize sin. Just as disease seems to take over, control aspects of our life, control people and things that we're around, Sin is the same way. The way it comes in, so small and subtle. It started with a fruit. It's just a fruit off this tree. And it led to the fall of mankind and things we deal with even over 7,000 years later. Cain's small sin of disobedience when the Lord didn't approve his sacrifice of fruit. He got jealous and that sin of jealousy and a little bit of anger led to the sin of murder. Sin gets in and it's a small thing and it just grows. And the enemy uses that as temptations to try and get us to fall into sin. And our minds are this battleground, this good versus evil, happy versus sad, high versus low. And the highs can be so high, but the lows can get so low. And without a grounded faith in Jesus Christ, it can lead to tragedy. It can lead to just a a total resentment of anything to do with God because our faith isn't in God. Our faith can be put in all these other things, all these churchy things, all this other religious stuff. But if our faith isn't in Jesus Christ and him alone, it'll lead to a life that is empty, lonely, depressed, full of stress and anxiety, full of a life that has tried everything that the world can offer. And it always leads back. And that's where this woman is at, this constant chase to feel better, to feel something different, to feel something that's not her reality. She's alone, totally isolated. That's her disease. Let's look at the next, which is her disease leads to her desperation. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him. The crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I can only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. If I can just get to Jesus. Once again, I love my brother Aaron this morning and his testimony because it fits so perfect with our message today. And the fact that he would went to the doctors and tried everything. And it was to a point where they told him that that you're not going to walk by the time you're 25. You're going to be in a wheelchair. But this lady said to herself, if I can just get to Jesus, if I can just fight my way to Jesus, I've tried everything else. I've tried all the other things that the world says I need to 
to try. I've tried all the medicines. I've tried all the doctors. If I can just get to Jesus. I heard what he done for the paralytic. I heard what he done for the lame man and the blind man. I seen the way that he set with publicans and sinners. I seen his compassion and I seen his love. If I can just get to Jesus. But you see, the issue is this woman's not supposed to be in the crowd. This woman's not supposed to be around other people. So I'm sure she covers herself up so that nobody would recognize her. And she fights through the crowd. She's got to get to Jesus. She's got nowhere else to go. Her life is laid out before. Her life is empty. She's tried everything and nothing has helped. She's got nothing left to give and nowhere to go. So she's got to get to Jesus. And the crowd, Luke tells us and Mark tells us, is so aggressive that they use the word thronging in. Everybody has packed in on Jesus because he's like a celebrity. Everybody wants to be around Jesus because at that time Jesus healed everyone that asked for healing. Our scripture is very clear about that. And there's no sophisticated medical system. There's no actual healing of disease or virus until the early 1900s. So who wouldn't want to be around Jesus? Jesus offers healing. Jesus offers a different life. So people are thronging into him. The crowd's so aggressive and so tight coming in on Jesus and this little weak, frail, diseased woman, she's weak because of her disease, fights her way through the crowd, fights her way through everything, and she gets to Jesus. How could we not love that? How could we not love the, the tenacity of her? And we got to love this about Jesus too, and that he maybe chose to walk her way. He could have went down a different street. He could have went down a different path. He could have passed by different houses. But Jesus chose to go down the street in front of her house, maybe to see her faith, maybe to see if she was willing to come out and fight through the crowd. And this woman, if doubt had dominated her, she would have stayed back. If fear had dominated her, she would have stayed back. If worry had dominated her, she would have stayed back. But her, pray, her faith prevailed. Her faith said, I've got to get to Jesus no matter what. I've got to get to Jesus because I know he's something different. I know he can change my situation. I know he can heal me physically, emotionally, spiritually. I've got to get to Jesus for my family. I've got to get to Jesus for my kids. I've got to get to Jesus for my marriage. I've got to get to Jesus for my church. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it's by her faith that she fights through the crowd, fights through her worry, fights through her doubt, fights through everything, and she gets to Jesus. She says, if I can just get to Jesus, I know he can change it. All these medicines I've spent everything on, and they've left me empty. They've left me broken, an empty vessel. But Jesus Christ can take that empty vessel that has nothing left, that's broken, that's given everything, and he'll take that vessel, fill it up with living water and change it all. Change the situation. Change your life forever. Faith prevails. Faith in Jesus Christ and him alone prevails. And that's this woman. She said to herself, if I can just get to Jesus... And the difference between her and all the crowd, the other people that's pressing up on Jesus, that they all want a part of Jesus. They all like Jesus. They all really like Jesus' miracles. They really like what he does. They like his healings. But their faith wasn't in Jesus. Their faith was in those things. The difference is this woman, her faith was in Jesus and him alone. Not the other stuff. And friends, as we reflect on just church and the American church and who we are, where is our faith at? Where is my faith at? This is for me as I read scripture and I have to investigate my own life and put my life to test. Who am I? Is my faith in the church stuff? Is my faith in the building? Is my faith in the pastor? Is my faith in the music? Is that where everything's going? Or is my faith in Christ alone? Because it's only Jesus Christ that can change it. You can tag his name to whatever you want to, but it's his will be done. And his will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus Christ's will is that we all be in heaven. But it doesn't always happen that way because our faith gets distracted by other things. 
And we put our faith in the things of this world. We put our faith in all the medicines and all the other stuff. We put our faith in the, in the other stuff like the crowd. But our faith must be in Jesus Christ and Him alone, only Christ. Her disease led to her desperation to get to Jesus. Finally, in verse 29, we see her deliverance. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for always being in control of everything. Lord, I could get up here and use millions of words and speak as elegantly as I possibly could. But it wouldn't change a thing. But Lord, just one touch, just one look, from you changes lives. It heals and it saves souls. Lord, forgive us for getting in the way. Forgive me for getting in the way. You know, sometimes you got to fight. This woman fought through the crowd. Sometimes you got to fight through. Sometimes you got to walk away from relationships. Sometimes you got to leave certain friends and stay out of certain places. The Bible wasn't being insensitive or prejudiced when it said, be not unequally yoked. Because if you and your spouse don't have the same goals in life, if you and your friends have different goals for life, it'll never work. It'll be like two positively, positively charged magnets constantly pushing against each other. If you're trying to get to Jesus and they're not, you're reaching for them with this hand and they're grabbing this hand, pulling you away. It'll never work. Weeds will always take over a landscaped area. That's why we got to keep the weeds pulled in our life. I don't know why that was so important this morning. But our focus has to be on Jesus and nothing else in, in this life. Disease reminds us of how fragile life really is. Of how important it is to take care of our loved ones. How important it is to make sure that we are ready to face God Almighty one day in eternity. That's what this life's about. And if the disease of sin has overtaken us or we haven't manicured our landscaping and pulled those weeds that were constantly being pulled away from Jesus Christ, our life will remain like this woman. The only answer is getting to Jesus. My family depends on it. My kids depend on it. My community depends on it. This church depends on it. We must take our problems to Jesus. We must take our blessings to Jesus. We must take every aspect of this life to Jesus because nothing else matters. Everything else in this world leaves us empty. Everything in this world takes, just like the doctors and the other things from this woman, the other people. If it was up to them, they, she would have stayed in that house. She would have stayed bound. They were constantly taken from her. But Jesus Christ gives. Jesus Christ gives freely. Eternal life is a gift from God that He gives freely. That's the difference. We must take it to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Where were we? Verse 29. Her deliverance. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And I love this because the next verse we see the disciples. But his disciples said unto him, You see the multitude thronging you and you say, Who touched me? <laughs> so the disciples have a little sarcasm here. Jesus, the crowd's pushing up on you. All these people around you. I mean, there's a, everybody's shoving, grabbing, yelling, all this stuff. And you're going to ask who touched you? One of these days, the disciples will realize that he's the son of God. And they'll quit asking questions like this. Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. 
But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what she had done, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This lady that's broken, that has nothing left, she's weak, frail, diseased, ridden, fights her way through the crowd, gets to Jesus, and Jesus immediately, in an instant, heals her. Your Bible might say straightway. That means immediately it happened. It wasn't a gradual thing. It wasn't a slow thing. It didn't take days and days or weeks and weeks to happen. It happened immediately. And Luke indicates, as you can see this morning, I brought this. This is Dad's. It's a prayer shawl. And most Jewish men, especially rabbis and Pharisees, and Jesus would have wore one of these. And what it is, Luke says that more so than she just grabbed the bottom of his robe or the hem of his garment, that she grabbed one of these tassels here. And these tassels, they would wear this, this prayer shawl, and the tassels were to remind them of God's commandments, to keep, keep them out of temptation, keep them out of sin. They were, they were supposed to look at these and, and be reminded of God and how to, how to act, how to be. Kind of like people wear WWJD bracelets now or have Bible verses printed out and hung on walls. It's to remind them, a constant reminder that God's there and God's watching. And the Pharisees being the Pharisees, you know, they would really do up their tassels real big and thick so that they were, you know, well respected by everyone else. But Luke indicates that she reached uh, and grabbed Jesus, the bottom of his prayer shawl, the tassels here. And he turns around and he says, who touched me? Everybody in this crowd is trying to touch you, Jesus. And Jesus says, who touches me? And I love this about Jesus because he's accessible to us. He's not laid up in a five-star hotel somewhere like these phonies on TV that's screening people as they come through the doors and seeing if they have physical infirmities. But Jesus Christ, who created, made everything in this world, he is living amongst his creation. He's walking right in the middle of the street, walking right in the middle of all the people, and he's accessible. I love this about Jesus, that he's not some some being or some force that's out there that doesn't have feeling, that doesn't feel what is going on in life. That's not true. Our scriptures say that when she grabbed the the tassel, the bottom of his garment, he says, who touched me? I felt virtue come out of my body. I felt power come out of my body. That is Jesus Christ. He hears every prayer we pray. He sees every tear we cry. He feels the power come out of his body. Every time a life is changed, Every time a soul is saved, he is that personal. He is that involved in our life. He's not like these other little gods, Aaron, that sit on a bench somewhere. Some are made out of wood. Some are made out of stone. Some just an imagination made up like the little chubby Buddha at the Chinese restaurant. They're all made up in your imagination. They can't do nothing for you. But Jesus Christ, the living God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, walked right in the middle of his creation, not hiding from from anyone, not trying to be distracted by anyone. He knew what he was doing. He walked across the water. He did whatever he needed to do to get to his disciples. And he does the same in our life. He'll do the same for you, just like he did this woman. He's right here and accessible. And all he is is a reach away. All she had to do was fight through the crowd. Her faith led her out of that house. Her faith led her down the street. Her faith led her to fight through that crowd. And her faith made her grab the bottom of his robe because I know if I can just get to Jesus, He can change it all. He can change my situation. And she's scared. She's trembling in fear because she ain't supposed to be out. She ain't supposed to be in the middle of people. She's supposed to announce her presence. I'm unclean. And here she is rubbing everybody's shoulder. And she grabs Jesus' garment, the Messiah. So when Jesus says, who touched me? And he turns around. Of course, she's scared. The Pharisees would have stoned her right there in the streets. But Jesus Christ gives her that look like we talked about last week. When he looked at Matthew, and it's a look that goes so much deeper than the superficial things of this world. It's a look that goes beyond our eyes. 
And it goes into our hearts, into our soul. It's this look that's calling us out without saying a word. And he looks at her. And it's this little woman that fought through the crowds. And she comes and tells him everything. Falls at his feet and tells him everything. Why is that important? Because that's salvation. Salvation is, is bringing it to the Lord. To cry out to God. To pour it all out. Lord, this is who I am. Matthew wasn't hiding what he was. He was sitting right at his booth. This lady's not hiding who she is. She's this frail, diseased woman. Here I am, Lord. This is me. I'm ugly. I'm broken. I'm empty. I'm diseased. I'm unclean. And she pours out her heart to God. That's salvation. To confess our sins with our mouth and confess Him as Lord. And so her claim this morning, her faith says, if I can just get to Jesus. And Jesus makes this crazy bold claim. He calls her daughter. She goes from diseased and desperate to delivered and a daughter, a child of God. Now you can imagine what the crowds were thinking. You can imagine what this woman's thinking. You can imagine what everything that's going on, all the pandemonium, all the craziness, the pushing, the shoving, the yelling, and now you can almost hear a pin drop. Because Jesus changed this lady's life forever and calls her daughter. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. This word whole is big because it was more than just a physical healing. It was more than just her disease was gone, and it was. But she was made whole spiritually. Her faith was put in to the Savior. Her faith was put into the Deliverer. Her faith was put into Jesus Christ, the living God. And because her faith was in Jesus Christ, she was made whole spiritually. No longer an outcast, no longer unclean, no longer isolated and alone, but now completely healed and a child of God. And friends, just once again, as my brother said, our faith cannot be in the things of this world. How many times do politicians have to let us down before we realize our faith can't be in them? Our faith can't be in armies. Our faith can't be in the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. Our faith can't be in nations or things of this world. Our faith must be in Jesus Christ. Don't put your faith in the church. Don't put your faith in the pastor. Put it in Jesus Christ. Get blinders on. Quit looking at the other things. The enemy will use whatever he can to distract you. But look at Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your life on Jesus. Jesus, keep your faith on Jesus because he has the ability to change it all. He has the ability to heal. He has the ability to speak a word. He has the ability to cast out demons. He has the ability to walk on water and raise again the third day. And if he's got the ability to do all that, he can change your situation. He can heal that infirmity if he wants to, if that's his will. He can save your soul. Maybe you're in that spot where you're not like this woman. I'm not diseased. I'm not eat up. And she's a unique case. You can't help but feel sorry for her. And sometimes that's where we don't need to be at. Because we compare ourselves with everything else. This woman had nothing. I'm not like that. Praise God. Maybe you're not like that. But you know, sometimes we've got to be backed into a corner. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. Sometimes we have to get to our Alamo where there's nowhere else to go. I've tried it all, and here I am. The disease of sin has led me to this spot in my life that I'm broken, and I have nothing, just like the prodigal son that was laid up with the pigs. Sometimes we have to be backed into a corner before we finally cry out to God before we finally fight through our pride, before we finally fight through our sin, before we finally fight through our disease and all this other stuff, when we finally cry out to God. And that's okay. 
Because sometimes that's where God shows up the biggest. Sometimes that's where we see the power and the amazement of who he is. How he can come into a life. How he can change a life. How he can save souls and forgive sins. How he can make people do a U-turn. I look through human eyes. You look through human eyes. But Jesus Christ, when he looked at this woman, he didn't see a diseased woman. He seen faith that could move mountains. Her disease was terrible. I can't imagine what it must have been like living this way. Totally isolated and alone. And I hope that that never happens to anybody. But I've heard my brother, Tony Corbin, talk about having a heart attack during COVID quarantines and having to lay in the hospital room alone without any visitors and how miserable it really was. Having to be alone and imagine this woman going through it for 12 years. No wonder she's desperate for something different. And so I ask you this morning, friend, are you desperate for something different in your life? Are you desperate for a reality change? Are you desperate for a life change? Are you desperate for a soul change? A change in your marriage, a change in your family, a change in your kids, a change to that addiction, a change to that chains or bind, whatever binds you. We've got to get desperate for Jesus Christ. All this other stuff, all these other things in the world, we seem to pursue them and we'll go after them with everything we got and it leads us back to our place that we started. Only Jesus Christ contains deliverance. Only Jesus Christ has salvation. And it's only in Him is there healing and life-changing ability. She was diseased and desperate. Now she's delivered and a daughter of the child of God. She's a child of God. How amazing is our God this morning? And I appreciate testimonies. I love to hear the stories of how God impacts each individual's life separately in this this unique kind of way. He's so good and faithful. And so I encourage you this morning, Christians, church, tell us your testimony. Tell us what God has done in your life. Tell us the way that you were desperate and backed into a corner and God showed up in a big way and delivered you. Let us hear about it. Let the world hear about it. We must tell what Jesus done in our life. Jesus publicly healed her. Jesus publicly made her whole because he was telling the whole world, look, look what I can do. Look who I am. And our scripture gives no glory to her disease. Our scripture gives no glory to sin. Our scripture gives no glory to anything else other than Jesus Christ, who has the power to change it all. There is salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone. And I urge you, Christian, if the Lord is dealing with you this morning about sharing it, about telling it, you must do it. I talked to a brother this morning early, and the Lord had laid one of our cousins on his heart That's because the Lord has a plan. We must follow him and be obedient. And if you're watching this morning and you're dealing with whatever it is in life that's just bound you and got you down, run to Jesus with it. Everything in life depends on it. Jesus wants to be involved in every aspect of our life, not just church. He's not a Sunday morning God. He is a 24-7 365 days a year, God, personally involved with us. So I urge you this morning, seek him out. Cry out to him. Bring your problems to him. Lay them down. Fall at his feet just as this woman done. And watch what he can do in your life. He is that good. He is that compassionate. He is that loving. He is a savior. He is a redeemer. He is a rescuer. He is accessible. And I love him dearly. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. 
Thank you for being all these things and even more to us, Lord. We these little little humans that think we know so much and think we have so much strength, but Lord, sometimes the things that come against us in like disease shows us how fragile and out of control we really are. And Lord, if our faith is in anything else, it's going to fail, it's going to fall, it's going to crumble around us. Our faith must be in you holy. You 100%. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Just a reminder that there is no Wednesday night service, and we will resume in-person service next Sunday morning, so I look forward to seeing you all uh, soon. You all have a great week.